<laughs> it flew off me. Well, good morning, church. And hello to those online. Good morning to you as well. Uh, if you weren't uh, with us throughout this service and watching this later or just the sermon time, go back and find some Peace Like a River. Uh, was sung by, uh, we have a small choir today because of all the weather and everything, but they were mighty, right? And uh, so thank you all for that. Thank you so much as well. Uh, so it reminded me of my uh, youth ministry days. That was a song we always sang, and I, I had to hold back my, uh, my little hand motions that I could, I could next time. So, uh, but yeah, so thankful for you. Let's uh, pray together. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, church, we are in a sermon series. Woohoo! So uh, I forgot to tell you that until a little bit later in the service last time, but we're going to start that off right at the beginning here today, that we are in part two of a series, and we're calling this, uh, you know, I was laughing with Nancy this morning that uh, apparently I made it rebuilding the house last time. This week I put rebuilding the wall because apparently I can't remember my own sermon series title this week, but uh, it's just how life is sometimes. So we're just going to go with rebuilding the wall from now on, but uh, well, it's, it's the house too. You know what I'm talking about uh, as we're here. But we're going to be talking about part two. And where we left off uh, last week was this idea is that we're reading through the story of Nehemiah, this great, amazing story of Nehemiah. And I love it for many different reasons, but one, it is in hard times. It is in times of struggle, if you will. It's in times of heartache, if you will. And uh, it's a story about people coming together and making something great happen. And of course, rebuilding something that was lost and rebuilding it for future generations and for God to be at work once again. And so we've been looking at this story and well, to applying it to our own church and where we are in our walk with God and where we are in the times that we live in. But it's important to remember kind of where we're at in case you weren't here last week. So uh, when you look at the history of Israel, there is kind of three big empires, if you will, that really come around this time of Nehemiah and shortly before him. First was Assyria, and uh, basically they come in and knock out the northern kingdom of Israel and take them off and destroy it. And then Babylon comes and actually conquers Jerusalem itself. And when they conquered it, they don't just come in, conquer, and you know, put some people there in charge. They actually come in, rip everybody out of power, and anybody with, with any kind of so-say-so, take them out and disperse them throughout their empire. And so they did this, and then, of course, what happens eventually is Babylon falls to another big world power, Persia. And so where we're at in the story is that the people of God have now not only been conquered by Assyria and Babylon, but Persia is the, the big cat of the day, if you will. They are the big dog of the time. And so they are conquered most of the land, and yet even at this time, Jerusalem has yet to be rebuilt. It's still lying in ruins, and the walls are torn down, and the people are suffering. The gate, city gates are still burned. And what happens, of course, is that the people of God end up serving in the Persian Empire. And one of them was a man named Nehemiah, who was a faithful Jew and wanted to serve God. And so when he heard the report as he was sitting at the citadel of Susa of the Persian Empire, he was cupbearer to the king. And so when he heard some of his fellow Jews had just come back from Jerusalem and heard the story of what was going on and how Jerusalem was still in ruins, his heart hurt, right? As we talked about last week. And he took time and he mourned. I guess what? It's a sermon series, so the story doesn't stop there. And if you've ever read the book of Nehemiah, it'd be kind of a bummer if it ended right there, but of course it doesn't. The story's going to keep going, which of course is what we're looking at here today. And we're going to be looking at sort of just a, a short part of this story, if you will, but a very critical part of the story. See, where we left it out last time was Nehemiah was in mourning, in grieving. But here's the situation that he found himself in. And the Persian kings, as we understand in history, it was kind of a different world. What I mean by that is there were certain gates and certain areas that when you entered in, even if you were a servant or whoever you were, or if you were a vassal coming in, you were to be bright as day. When you walked through this certain gate, for instance, you walked in and you had to come before the king and you could not be sad. It was to put your life at stake because you were not supposed to be sad in front of the greatness of his majesty, if you will. You see how this goes. And so we see this not only played out in Nehemiah, but also the story of Esther as well. The kings of Persia were supposed to be, you know, you were supposed to bask in their glory, so to speak. They were supposed to be so great and awesome that none of your worries in life could worry you, and you couldn't help but be happy in their presence. 
And so Nehemiah, who's the cupbearer of the king, as it says in the book, he first hears about his fellow Jews in one month, and then a few months later, in the month of Nisan, is when he comes to the king, and he dares to be sad. Now he's cut bare. This wasn't, this wasn't like the king went four months without drinking some wine, you know what I'm saying? Like he was there day to day with the king, putting on a show, right? Mourning on the inside, mourning when he went home to his, his whatever he, I don't know if he had a home or he was in the palace or in the rooms or whatever, but wherever he went to when, his own, when he was on his own time is when he grieved, yet he had to put on this exterior to come in, to put on a show for the king. Until one day, Nehemiah was ready. Now, don't miss this critical piece. Nehemiah shows up to the king and looks sad. In other words, finally his outward appearance matches what was going on in his heart, and his life is on the line, because use is a big no-no. You don't do this with the Persian kings. And yet Nehemiah dares to say, I've grieved, I'm going to do something. And in his heart of heart, it would have been easy for him to just go on daily life and in his position of power, so to speak, and I'm sure in some luxuries of what his position was, got to have many different luxuries in life. It would have been easy for him to say, well, so sad for my brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. Hope it goes well for him. In there. And Nehemiah at some point said, nope. I must do something. And in this case, in Nehemiah's case, that is, not only will I do something, but I will risk much. It was one of those gut check moments, right, where all of a sudden, to be a people of God and to have some type of position of power and some maybe ability to do something about Jerusalem, would he risk it or would he not? That gut check moment of, I want something, I want to rebuild something, I want something that is gone to be made once again. And that gut check moment of saying, I will put in the work. I will suffer the wrongs. I will make the trials go. I will endure them to make such thing happen. Notice Nehemiah doesn't say, I really wish someone else would do this. Right? He doesn't write a letter to some other powerful Jews, maybe out in the diaspora of Persian Empire, and say, hey, why don't you all come on down here and talk to this king and get set him straight and help him out here, you know? No, his words maybe echoed Isaiah when he responded to the Lord, I will go, Lord. Or maybe when Samuel was sitting there hearing the voice of the Lord speak to him, and he said, speak, Lord, for I am listening, ready to do your will. See, there's that gut check moment in this story where Nehemiah has to put off himself, so to speak, and to put on the people of God, he says, we've lost too much. I must rebuild. I'll even put my life on the line. I will do something. But church, I mentioned last week that in some ways we've lost. In some ways we're rebuilding. In some ways we're questing and yearning and praying for once again for God to do something in this church and for this community to be the light on a hill for many, many years to come. I want you to know last week uh, there was a little bit of a challenge where I mentioned that uh, we needed some communion stewards, and not only stewards, but also someone to help with communion and someone else to help count during service. And guess what? There were some volunteers. And we filled those roles here today. In fact, there was more than just one volunteer in each of those roles. In fact, I had a work out the counting situation to say, hey, you're going to count this time, you're going to count this time. We had to work out all those details. But there were people and flag planters among you that said of those simple things, yes, I will do something. Not only that church, but I heard this week from numerous people through either phone calls or emails or just conversations that came in and told me, pastor, whatever you need in these days ahead, just ask, and I will do it. You see, church, if you're wondering if there's people in this congregation that are saying, yes, Lord, use me, here I am, they're here. And the question is, are you also one of them? You see, people may come and volunteer, 
And you may wonder, do you make a difference? Would one person ever make a difference? Well, Nehemiah was one powerful force, as we're going to see in this story. But it all started with him saying, yes, Lord, I will do it. Of course, there's other people in the story that help him along the way, but it started with Nehemiah himself facing himself in the mirror and daring to go before the king to look sad. And the king asked him, what is it you want? And he boldly proclaimed. It says he prayed as he did this, but he prayed to the Lord God and he boldly toward the king what it is he wanted to do. You see, it may take too much for just one person, but for many it can do amazing things. But there are stories in history of great people doing amazing things. Uh, you know, it wasn't so long ago I learned this story that I had never heard before in, in history. And how many of you have heard, let's see a show of hands this morning, how many of you heard of Sir Nicholas Winton? Anyone? Maybe I see kind of some people going, maybe I've heard that name, maybe, maybe. Well, I want to tell you about this. This is someone in history that is not so famous and actually kind of got lost in time but was refound later. You see, Sir Nicholas Winton, of course, was just Nicholas Winton. And he was 1938. He was living in London. It was, of course, right before World War II. He was a 29-year-old stockbroker in, in London and was doing quite well for himself, had many of the luxuries of life, many of the things people crave. He himself was a German-Jewish immigrant, uh, the son of them, that is, and even though he was uh, British and proper, so to speak, but he came from an immigrant family. Of course, during his time, he saw what was going on in the world. He saw Hitler rising to power. He saw the Nazis rising to power, and he kind of just knew in his heart war was going to be imminent. And even though there was much appeasement that happened in those days, he just knew in his own heart that this was not where it was going. And so when Hitler's troops, that is, went in and, and started controlling Czechoslovakia, it was one of those first kind of tipping points of things happening. It was the first refugee crisis of the war. It was 150,000 people, they think, fled in Czechoslovakia, ended up in Prague, trying to get out and trying to find a way away from the Nazis. Well, Winton had a friend, and they were supposed to go on a ski trip. And when this happened, they said, you know what? Instead of going on a ski trip, why don't we go to Prague and see what's going on? And so they did. They canceled their ski trip. They still took their vacation days from work, and they went over to Prague. And what they found there were dire conditions. They found families that were wanting to get out, and no one in Europe would take them. And they found parents desperate for just their kids to have some type of life. And so they found these parents that were desperate for their children to be able to get out, even if they couldn't, but to let their children have a life and live on from what was going on and what was coming and what everybody knew. Even though I don't think we knew quite, even though they knew quite how bad it would get, but they knew that it was bad and it was not good. And so Winton decided he was going to focus on those children that their parents wanted to get out. And so he started to lay all the groundwork when he was there for those couple of days. He met different parents, got their families, got as much information from them as they could, and all the different paperwork and details of their children. He started finding uh, certain routes and certain things to happen. He started a fake organization when he got back to Britain after that you know, little mid-vacation. He even had his mother work in the office to kind of put a show front on for the, for the foundation, if you will. He ended up having a skilled negotiator. He ended up negotiating with British government where he could and making it possible for these children to come in with out any parental guidance, if you will, just uh, unaccompanied minors. And so these families, he found families to take the children in. He had to raise money. He even had to make some bribes. He even had to forge some documents. But he saw the dire need, and he had to work, so he did. Well, Before the war officially started, that is, and when it really started going, he was able to take seven trains, kids from Prague, and bring them to Britain. It was in 1939. There was an eighth train, which unfortunately uh, never made it. No one really knows what happened to them, but the war eventually started right after that eighth train, and so they had to kind of put the effort on hold because it just, the, the bureaucracies wouldn't work and the practicality of it. No one knew. None of the people knew. It was Nicholas Winton that did it. It took the survivors 50 years to track down, and I'm sure they did it through records or whatever, to track down who it was that brought them to Britain. 
So out of the children that were brought out, 669 children were saved. And in the time of the article that I last looked up, I found one in 2015 on CBS News, and it was saying 6,000 people at that time were descendants from those 669. They called themselves Nick's family, of course, in honor of Nick. You see, one person can make a huge, huge difference. And where maybe we talk about Schindler or maybe uh, some other people that were very famous. Sir Winton was knighted much later, 50 years later, I understand. After the fact, he did all this. Never sought glory, never even sought anybody to know. Until they tracked him down for his good works. and Gave him all the honors. Anyway. You see, sometimes there's a gut check. And church, even, after, even if this vote had never happened, there'd still be a gut check. Because if you look around at our nation, churches are closing at an alarming rate. They are. From all angles, from all cities, from all demographics, churches are closing. The gut check, people. Who's going to carry on the gospel for this community? I often read and go back in our little kind of memoir section back there where we still have some of our history. And I love reading about these stained glass windows. I understand that it's primarily this one I think it was written about. But it was some ladies from the church that would go to Ohio State Fair every year and sell all sorts of goodies that paid for this window. You see, when the time came, they wanted the community to have the gospel preached to them. They wanted to stay in windows that would proclaim the birth of our Lord and Savior the faithfulness of Mary looking up to God to tell that story. And so they said, yes, I will. I will go. I will go all the way up. I know now it seems like a hop, skip, and jump, but I'm sure at the time it wasn't, right? I will go all the way up to the Columbus State Fair every year and sell some goodies. Do all the work that's involved in that to make sure this community hears the gospel. Church, if you won't, who will? I want to challenge you. I have a tentative date set. As I mentioned before in my last sermon, that there are many different things we need to uh, address just as far as kind of committees and, and people on those and people serving. But I want to let it sit for a minute. I'm not going to sign up today. I'm not going to get out the pow uh, PowerPoint and have you all volunteer. But I do want to challenge you to sit and to pray about it. God calling you make sure the gospel endures in this community and in this church? Are you willing to put in the hard work that's going to be necessary for, that, for this church to thrive again? And to once again, as I mentioned last week, but I want to mention again, when I first came here, so many people talked about this church felt like home. Church, it's possible to do that again. It is. But it takes you. It takes me. It takes all of us chipping in and doing our part. So I have a date. I'm going to call it a ministry table meeting, but it's not. <laughs> it's just kind of what the term we use. It's going to be a show up and volunteer meeting is what we're going to call it, right? And I'm tentatively planning it on, uh, and I need to double check some things with the boss lady. You know how that goes. But February 11th, it's a Saturday before the Super Bowl. We're going to come to this room. I hope God has laid on your heart to say, yes, I will do something. And we're going to go through, we're going to elect lay leaders. We're going to go through, we're going to set up our staff parish relations. We're going to set up our trustees. We're going to set up all those different things to make sure this church has the foundational pouring for the good things that are to come. So if you can't make it, please contact me. That day is not good for you. It's a snow day. I don't know what we'll do, but we'll figure it out. But just put that February 11th on the Saturday. We'll do it in the morning. Come in here and to start rebuilding. But until then, I want to ask you, if you heard the walls of need amending, if you heard the people were in dire straits, would you be like Sir Winton? Would you go and do what you can? Are you prepared to volunteer or even nominate for the things that need to be done to make sure our church has that solid foundation to build on?
Let us pray. God, as we're here today, we thank you so much for your love. And Lord, in so many ways, uh, life is not easy. In so many way, ways, we face hardships. But God, as we're here today, we once again walk in boldness. Not because of our own strength, but because of you. For God, you are the God who is with us. We remind ourselves that you are not done with this church and for any who are willing. For those people that are saying, yes, Lord, send me. God, you can do amazing things. We take heart, Lord, that it was only 12 men that you poured your life into. Even one of those betrayed you, yet the other 11 set the world on fire. So God, find one within us hearts again that trust not only in you, that not only hope in you, but are willing to get up and to do once again what is necessary to come before a king, even be sad in the presence, once again put ourselves at risk so that your kingdom may grow, and your walls may be repaired, and that this house may be an enduring house of your love for generations to come. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.